Since 2002, the IFAW's Northern Dogs Project has been delivering veterinary services to First Nations communities in Northern Quebec. The project combines dog population management with a public education campaign to raise awareness of dogs in the community and their needs. We used to have to talk a lot about why we would do these things. Why would you spay and neuter your dog or why would you vaccinate your dog and now people come. They know. They don't want any more puppies or they've seen their female get really skinny when she's lactating or feeding her puppies. And so now we have people come in. They want their dogs spayed or neutered. They want them vaccinated. The lack of veterinary services in the north presents challenges for dogs and their owners. But if there's one thing everyone agrees on, it's that the dogs in these communities are really special. These dogs, they do their dog stuff. They hang around, they exercise a lot. They're not confined in a house from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. They go for swim and stuff, so they're really stable psychologically. People here, like people everywhere, really love their dogs. So IFA keeps coming in and each year uh, making a difference in our community. Population has gone down, happiness has gone up. <laughs> so thank you, IFA. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our second episode of Conversations on Conservation and Animal Welfare. My name is Jan Hanna, and I run IFA's Northern Dogs Project. Dogs fill our lives in so many ways. They are our companions through life. They offer us protection and loyalty. They make us smile and laugh with joy. And when we are sad, they're there to console us. They are our best friends. They are our family. But many of the world's dogs live in a very different life, one that is more dog and less us. A perfect example of this are the northern dogs who live in remote communities of northern Canada. A northern dog isn't a breed. It's a dog of all shapes and sizes. Being a northern dog is a lifestyle. They are what we call free roaming. That just means unrestricted in a house or a backyard, they are free to explore their surroundings, choosing how they want to spend their time and who they want to spend it with. Free roaming allows them to connect with their more natural instincts and behaviors. This makes these dogs more intelligent, interactive, and social as they navigate a world truly as a dog. Don't get me wrong, these dogs may be free, but they're not wild and they're certainly not strays. They have owners. They know their families and where they live. They love their people, especially their kids. Where there are children, there are always northern dogs. But this way of life for northern dogs has proved to be a double-edged sword. Although this free-spirited nature is what makes them unique, it can also make them misunderstood by the humans they coexist with. These northern dogs often become viewed as a nuisance. Dogs being dogs, doing dog things that are not always conducive to the health and safety of community members. As a result, conflicts arise between human and canine. Stanford Owl, an animal control officer in one of these remote communities, has experienced this conflict firsthand. Back when he first started his job, there were dogs running around everywhere. People were afraid to go outside because of these packs of roaming dogs. As a result, they would often throw rocks at the dogs or carry sticks in defense, which only made the dogs become more excited. This in turn scared more people. It was a vicious cycle. This was the reality of just one of many communities experiencing the rising tension between dogs and the people who they live with. As a project manager for the International Fund for Animal Welfare in Canada, I knew we had to do something. In 2002, we created the Northern Dogs Project. Through this project, IFA partners with Indigenous communities in Northern Canada to develop effective programs with solutions to cultivate a peaceful coexistence between Northern Dogs and their people. But before I go into what the Northern Dogs Project actually does, let's take a step back and see how we got to this situation to begin with. The relationship between human and canine in these communities wasn't always fraught with conflict. The Northern Dogs Project started working with eight partner Cree communities. The Cree are one of the largest groups of First Nations, who we call Indigenous Peoples of Canada. These eight Cree communities are located along the east side of James Bay, which is at the bottom of Hudson Bay in northern Quebec and Ontario. James Bay is truly breathtaking. Hundreds of rivers flow through the surrounding region that is blanketed with lush forests. An abundance of wildlife like bears, wolves, and caribou call James Bay home, and so do the Cree. In this beautiful place, they lived off the land for hundreds of years, and always by their side, dogs. 
Dogs were valued workmates and family members. They hauled sleds, carried packs, and kept watch as guards around camp. They were an integral element to Cree culture, representing a strong connection to tradition and identity. But with time, tradition slowly faded. Things changed drastically in the 1980s when the Cree were forced to move off their traditional homelands to make room for a massive hydroelectric project in their territory. As they settled together into new communities, their culture was disrupted. They had to build lives that were very different from the natural rhythms they had followed for generations. All the while, their dogs were accompanying them through these radical changes. As Cree communities faced new challenges, so too did their four-legged companions. In a modernized world, they are no longer valued for the role they once filled as part of the family unit. Why use a dog for a job that can now be done by a truck or snowmobile? Dogs have lost their way and are caught between the workmates they used to be and the pets they have not fully become. As is human nature, we take care of the things that we value. And right now, dogs have precarious value in these communities. But dogs haven't gone away and are still very much a part of everyday life in these communities. With fewer meaningful jobs, they keep themselves busy by chasing after cars or barking at people walking by. As a result, dogs are often viewed as a nuisance. As with most First Nations across Canada, Cree communities continue to deal with the legacy of European colonization. There is insufficient housing, lack of drinking water, poor health care, and inadequately funded education. And people aren't the only casualty from this intergenerational trauma. If basic human needs aren't being met, the simple reality is that dogs' needs won't be met either. Lack of resources coupled with the perception that the dogs are a nuisance can result in abuse and cruelty. The bottom line is that these communities are not equipped to deal with their dog problems. That's where IFA's Northern Dogs Project comes in. We have programs made up of different tools that we tailor specifically to meet the needs of each community to help them fix their dog problems. And of course, the biggest need is improving the health and welfare of these animals. So every year, the Northern Dogs Project provides veterinary care. With a van loaded with all the necessary medical equipment and a team of eight, we travel hundreds of kilometers to each community to set up a mobile clinic. The community looks forward to these clinics, which are the only vet services available within hours. Once we arrive, we can set up for surgery in just 20 minutes. First, we're there to provide a vital need, spay and neuter. A roaming lifestyle with intact dogs means lots of puppies. This means more dogs, more welfare needs that can't be met. That's why providing spay and neuter services at our clinics is so important. In just one day, our vet team can spay and neuter up to 40 dogs. And in total, the Northern Dogs Project has provided more than 8,000 sterilizations, preventing tens of thousands of unwanted animals from entering the population, a crucial step in helping ease the pressure off the communities. But our clinics aren't just limited to spay and neuter. In just one set of clinics, we can respond and care for an estimated 500 dogs. We will do anything that's needed. Vaccinations, deworming, addressing cuts and wounds, setting broken legs from being hit by a car, and even removing porcupine quills. We also care for lots of puppies. This past June, at one of our clinics, the team encountered a first-time mother with seven two-day-old puppies who were very cold and hungry. But the mother wasn't producing enough milk. They needed to be fed immediately or else they wouldn't survive. First, we snuggled the pups together on heating pads to keep them warm. Then we used a syringe to feed them handmade milk solution. But that could only do so much for these hungry pups. We quickly loaded the mum and her pups into the van and headed back to the clinic. We actually put the pups on a nursing mother already at the clinic who had plenty of milk to share. Stories like this show how the team is ready for whatever comes our way. The Northern Dogs Project isn't just limited to veterinary care. We also provide shelter. Sometimes people forget that when we domesticated dogs long ago, we made a deal with them. In exchange for them helping us hunt, clean up our garbage, and sound the alarm against intruders, we agreed we would provide them food, water, and shelter against the elements. And in a place like James Bay, which is the southernmost part of Canada's Arctic region, adequate shelter is critical. 
with temperatures dipping below minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit and whipping wind and snow, shelter can be a hard thing to come by, even for the hardiest of northern dogs. A free-roaming dog at least has the ability to find shelter when need be. However, to make survival more challenging, not all the dogs in the communities are free-roaming. Some communities are moving towards tying up dogs as a solution to the issue of free-roaming dogs. Unfortunately, this leads to serious animal welfare concerns. Because when winter arrives, tied dogs can't find their own shelter, leaving them the most vulnerable to the bitter cold. That's why IFA has been making sure we help these communities keep their end of the bargain. For the past five years, we have been building and delivering Arctic-ready dog houses for those dogs who need shelter from these grueling winters. Built tough with asphalt shingles, insulated walls, a door flap, and carpet floor with straw-filled bedding, these dog houses have all the amenities that are the difference between life and death. Thanks to your support, hundreds of dogs now have a comfortable and cozy refuge where they can warmly curl up and call home. Whether it's operating clinics or delivering dog houses, the success of the Northern Dogs Project wouldn't be possible without one key factor, the cooperation of communities. We're there to foster close relationships by building respect and trust for one another through outreach programs. We work together to promote proper guardianship and animal welfare that ensures northern dogs receive the care they deserve. For example, remember Stanford Owl, the animal control officer I mentioned earlier? He reached out to IFA's Northern Dogs Project for help, and we supported him in setting up animal control practices. Stanford's work started to gain some notoriety among neighboring communities who were having similar issues with their dogs. Stanford is now helping those communities to set up healthy practices. We also spend a lot of time with the next generation, those who will be entrusted with continuing to improve the way dogs and people coexist. For example, we work together with First Nations curriculum developers to create a new educational resource specifically aimed for First Nations children. By bringing in perspectives of community elders and other role models across Canada, this educational tool uses their traditional culture, wisdom, and experience to highlight respect, empathy, and responsibility for dogs. And programs like this are working. We often hear from parents about how their children came home from a school presentation and taught them how to care for their dogs. Multiply that by thousands of students we have educated over the past 17 years, and you have positive change. And that is the ultimate goal of our project, changing attitudes and behaviors towards northern dogs. We are empowering people, even if it means the smallest of actions taken. One such action even led to a member of my own family, Paddington. Back in 2018, a concerned community member had messaged me about a dog lying lifeless in the road in the middle of winter. Even though Paddington was huge, a 70-pound St. Bernard Husky mix puppy, she couldn't just leave him there to suffer. She took him into her home to keep him safe and warm. When I came by the house to check on Paddington, it turns out he was suffering from a horrible case of Demodex mange, a skin disease caused by mites. He was missing large patches of fur on most of his face, his legs, and his belly. He had sores and infection on his exposed skin. And the sores were oozing pus and smelly, which made it even more incredible that this woman took Paddington into her home. At this level, the infection could be deadly. And without a proper coat to keep him warm, Paddington had been freezing to death outside in the winter cold. He was in such bad shape that I decided to take him back with me and personally care for him. We put him on meds to kill the mites and antibiotics to stop the infection. And we bathed him with special medicated shampoo. For days, Paddington had no energy. All he did was sleep, eat, and hobble outside to use the bathroom. But Paddington was a fighter. Slowly but surely, his immune system kicked in, his body healed, and over time, he fully recovered. His transformation was a complete 180. He went from being a despondent shell of a dog to the most goofy, joyful, loving dog in the world. I became so attached to him that I just couldn't let him go. And so I adopted him. He is alive and well today as a loving member of my family. And it wouldn't have been possible if not for that one community member who felt empowered to care for and do something. That's what it's all about. One woman's decision to take a freezing dog into her home may seem insignificant at first to the grand scheme of things. But small, individual actions like this pave the way for greater change.
Change takes time, resources, experience, and support. Okay, so you're sure, sure? Mm -hmm. People who have been living and caring for dogs in a certain way for a long time need to see a reason to change what they're doing. And to get there requires a thoughtful step-by-step -step process. With the Northern Dogs Project, we listen closely and we find our place in each community's needs. We work together to decide on what tools fit the situation, and then we provide those tools in an appropriate way. This comprehensive, multi-layered approach is what sets us apart and makes the Northern Dogs Project successful and sustainable with long-lasting effects in the community. First Nations communities share a unique, rich, and evolving relationship with their dogs. Dogs have been with them since the very beginning, more than 10,000 years ago when their ancestors first migrated from Siberia. And despite everything that Northern Dogs and First Nations communities have gone through together, the special bond between a dog and human is still strong and lasting. Day after day, year after year, dog after dog, guardian after guardian, the Northern Dogs Project is there to reaffirm that close bond. You're so happy now! No matter how roaming these dogs may be, the Northern Dogs of Canada will always have a welcoming place they can call home. Thank you to our IFA partners and donors for making this work possible. Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sabrina and I am honored to sit here with Jan Hanna, all the way from Canada. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So first and foremost, please make sure your volume is up so you can hear the great responses and questions we have coming our way. Feel free to start typing in your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, and Jan will be here to answer that. Jan, welcome. Right. So we have one question already from Rob in D.C., and Rob is asking, how much on average are the dog houses? These special winterized dog houses are obviously different than the ones we buy at like Home Goods at PetSmart. Yeah, so the dog houses cost between 100 and 150 dollars to make, and that's just the materials because it is three quarter inch plywood, and then it is the insulation and the asphalt and the door flaps and the carpet inside and the straw. So they're 100 150 dollars each. And through the years, we've had different partners make them. So we had we partnered with high school, a local high school in Canada, who built them. We had a home builder last year who wanted to do something good with the off cuts from his business, so he helped us. So every single year we have a different builder. That's really great, Jan. Can you talk to me a little bit? I think I noticed the dog houses in the video had flat roofs, yeah. which is something I haven't seen before. Yeah. So the flat roofs are because a lot of the dogs are husky crosses, so they like to sit on top of things, so we provided them with that space where they can sit on top. Then you make, you can make the overhang bigger and that way in the summer there's more shade. That's yeah. so cute. So thank you, Jen. We have another question from Deborah. Deborah's asking, what information do you have to help educate adults to change how they interact with dogs and to ultimately improve their lives? It's a great question, Deborah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the most important thing with any of this work and probably the work that other people are doing is that relationship. So I find the most valuable tool is that one-on-one -on -one that I'm having with people. You can figure out the context. You can figure out where they are in their information sharing and what kind of information they're looking for. And so, of course, there is always the possibility of writing something out and sharing it. But it may not be culturally contextual. It may not be the information that the person that you're talking to needs to hear. And so certainly with First Nations and certainly with all of us, relationships are so important. So I do find that one-on-one really valuable. And that trust that you've and been building for years. Yeah. And, that, and that community is just special. That's really great. Thank you for that question, Deborah. So let's see what other questions we have here. So Jen, what are some of the jobs, this is from Anonymous, what are some of the jobs <laughs> that dogs did that they're no longer doing in right. the Cree community? Right. And a lot of people ask that, a lot of people want to know what that relationship used to look like compared to what it looks like today. And so they did used to, there were some pictures, so they did used to haul sleds, 
definitely they were the alarm at camps and a lot of people still have camps so they go to their hunting camps and the dogs do live a very different life when they go out there they're still valued for being the alarm they did before plastic the same as in a lot of other cultures dogs ate garbage so they cleaned up that stuff so that's what you know definitely a lot of pulling and carrying hunting and alarm they have the machines to do so they that's a really hard yeah. Yeah. And that's why when people are at their camps, the dogs have sort of a closer relationship to that traditional relationship that they have with their owners. And then when they're in town, they're not doing those things or the houses are too close together. So even the alarm barking, it's not welcome when you're in town. Thank you. So we have, we have so many questions coming in, guys. Thank you. So we have another one from Mary. Mary's asking first, well, first, thank you for everything. Thank you, Mary. Is there any way for a veterinary technician from Minnesota to volunteer with your group in Canada? Yeah, you know what, Mary, I would email me and my email address will be available. What has happened is I have been lucky enough, I don't know, uh, Mary Jose Samard, who was the vet with the little blue cap that was talking, she has been my lead vet for the whole program. And that feeds back into that relationship building so you have to do your medicine in context. It's more that MASH mobile style. And then those of us out front, we have also been building those relationships with people all the time. Right. So, but definitely email me and I do take four texts up each time. Oh, great, great. Thank you for that question, Mary. That was really great. So we have, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so we also have another question from Michelle. Michelle's asking, how do you start this kind of project? I mean, you started the Northern Dogs Project. You saw a need and you filled it. So how do you do that? And how many people do you need to mobilize? Yeah, so when we started this project, the most important thing is that the community is your partner. And ergo, you don't start a program and take it into a community. It's that reaching out, that back and forth, that you set up that relationship. Because in order to be successful and sustainable, it is a partnership. Right. And so what I would recommend is if she does know of any communities that are, you know, their community members have reached out, nurses and teachers, a lot of external service providers in the communities are the first ones to reach out. Mm -hmm. Set up those conversations and see if you can talk to somebody in the van. Mm -hmm. Now, IFA, we are building a workshop that will train people how to work successfully and sustainably in communities. And so we'll be starting that new year. How cool is that? That's a New Year's resolution. Yeah. Michelle, stay tuned. You can email Jan and we'll get you that information once it's like up and running. But that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we have another question here from Margaret. She's asking, do you do this program, education, vet care, housing, only in Canada, or do you do this project also in the United States? So we have partnered with um, the, a group in the States, and we have been working on providing similar opportunities for tribal nations. That's great. So yes. And obviously what you've done in Canada works so well. Yes. Right? So kind of it's really patience and communication. And relationship. Right. Yeah. She also asks my favorite. I actually asked Jan this too. Does the project take care of any northern cats? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, somebody who works at this office has a northern cat. A northern cat. And I will admit that the cats are as exceptional as the dogs. Because number one, the cats are living outside too. So if you can be a cat and you can survive with free roaming dogs, you are an exceptional cat. They tend to be super social. Just like dogs. Just like dogs. Yeah, they're amazing. They're the best kind of cat. Yes. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love cats too. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Margaret. Uh, Heather, I have a question here from Heather. She says, thank you for all your work on this important and meaningful project. I'm based in D.C., but I'm from and grew up in Vancouver. Which specific First Nations people group do you work with? Out of BC. Out of BC? Yeah, sure. So we just did, I just did a training a couple of months ago with a group called Spirits Mission. 
and they were looking to improve their sustainable practices in communities. So they will actually be coming to the workshop that we're setting up okay. as well. There is also CARE, who does great work at NBC. There are many, many groups. When I first started this work, there really were no groups that were doing this work, and now there are lots of people involved in this work. So again, reach out to me, and I can certainly send email addresses to you. That's really great that we're all working together yeah. for yeah, helping more people and more dogs. Really great. Thank you, Heather, for that question. So the other question I have here is from Deborah. She says, I have encountered people who hit dogs and who leave their dogs inside for up to 14 hours a day. How would you recommend approaching them one-on-one -on -one to help? Yeah, that's always, that's, that's, tough. that's really tough. That's really tough because most people don't want to be told what to do. So again, it's navigating, finding that place when you meet that person and reach out to that person in a way that you are not telling somebody what to do, that you are having a conversation. There are reasons why people do things and we may not even understand what those reasons are. So maybe there's a way that she could help this person. Maybe the dog is inside for 14 hours because the person commutes two hours front and back of the day. Right. So again, I really believe in relationship and right. hearing what that person is and is there a space where she can help that person. That is great. That's great. Thank you, Deborah, for that question. Another question we have from Nicole. Nicole is asking, she wants an order dog. <laughs> She lives in the U.S. Yes. So how can Nicole possibly adopt a northern dog that needs a, a family? Right. So the objective of the program is always to leave dogs with their people in the community and then help those people to take care of their dogs. But there are always dogs that need mm -hmm. to come out, whether it is the hit-by-car dog or an unwanted litter or for some reason somebody is getting out. So um, I do have rescue partners that I use in Canada, all foster based, so the dogs get to go in a foster home. And I do rehome dogs through IFA. When I do have dogs, they are on pet finder. But admittedly, I do a lot of referral adoptions. So they, they don't often hit pet finder and they don't necessarily stay for very long. So again, reach out, we can talk, see what kind of like a waiting style. List. Yep. What kind of lifestyle and what kind of dog might suit you and we can see where that goes. You're a northern dog matchmaker. I am a northern dog matchmaker. <laughs> yes, That's great. Thank you for that question, Nicole. It's a great question. I have a question. Yes. Where's Paddington at? I mean, he should be right here. Should be. <laughs> we all agree. Paddington should be here. He's so, so, so lucky to have you. Handsome, healthy yes. guy. Yes, and Paddington was one of those cases. Um, I already had a handful, literally, of dogs and um, so I didn't need another dog, but I do. never did. But I did, as soon as I saw Paddington, I knew, I knew he was gonna stay. And it was, he has that total goofy, um, loves every single being, person, squirrel, cat, <laughs> that I knew I was gonna keep up. It was just a matter of like, easing that into the home with the husband. <laughs> So I do have one other question. Um, we have, might have time for two more. We have so many questions, and I encourage everybody who I don't have a chance to ask Jan on your behalf at this time to email Jan at jhanna, H-A-N-N-A-H, at ifaw.org with any further questions. So Anonymous is asking, if an educator or teacher wants to use this educational material pack that IFAW created with the communities, how can they access it? Excellent question, Anonymous. Right, and it's actually on IFA's website. So IFA.org slash living in a good way with dogs with dashes in between those words. Oh. So everything is available there, everything is downloadable, or you can reach out to me and I can send you copies for the class. Okay. Copies. So we do have printed versions. That's yes, excellent. I'm taking a peek. I mean, I want to do the coloring books. Yeah, they're really fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that was amazing. So let's see here. One more question we have here from Michelle. Michelle's asking, would it be better to be affiliated with a local rescue organization to begin a project like this? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. And I think that gets into that whole comprehensive nature of creating programs that are sustainable and lasting and in partnership. 
And so oftentimes the rescue component is important, but there's all sorts of partnership activities that need to be done in the communities. So not just taking dogs out, but actually trying to keep dogs in communities and build capacity so that they can manage their own dogs. So not necessarily, no. Great. Thank you for that question, Michelle. That actually concludes our time. Jan, thank you so much yeah, for coming down here from Canada for this to answer all these great questions. I know we have so many. I'm so sorry we don't have more time, but please make sure to join us for episode three. You'll be hearing more about it. And don't forget to email me or Jan with any further questions. We'd be happy to answer. Thank you and have a lovely evening. Thank you for coming. Bye.